digital payments and the connection of digital payments across countries. Uh, we are going to have one hour for this uh, this event, and uh, I will start uh, in a minute to invite uh, our uh, new section chief of the Financing for Development section of ESCAP, uh, Ms. Suba Sivakumaran. I would like to uh, announce that uh, we will have just a, just a little uh, a little uh, announcement. We have um, an evaluation form that will be shared towards the end of the event. So please uh, complete that evaluation form. And the, please, uh, during the event, if you have any questions, uh, please enter the questions in the in the chat box. So I've opened the floor now to Suba Siva Kumaran to give her opening her work and remarks. Thank you, Alberto. Um, I will keep my opening remarks short as I've only uh, we've only got an hour today, um, and this is a very interesting panel. So first, let me start by welcoming our esteemed colleagues and the audience and esteemed panelists. Uh, it is my great pleasure to to welcome you today to this timely discussion on accelerating progress on digital payments across borders, given what that means for progress towards the sustainable development goals in Asia and the Pacific. Um, as you may know, uh, given the economic and social importance of remittances alone, the SDGs do include the target of bringing down the average transaction cost of migrant remittances to under 3% by 2030. But today in Asia Pacific, the average cost of that small ticket transfer is between four to seven percent. And additionally, something you know we can't forget is that many transfers take a long time, which has an urgent and challenging pressure on families as well as on trade. As we know, the cost of transferring payments both within borders, but especially across borders, is a vital cost, not just for remittances, but cross-border e-commerce, trade and supply chains. It directly affects the competitiveness concerns for economies and importantly, it shapes the growth of future markets. So linking payment systems across borders is essential to open up new markets, to bring forward economic integration, which has been a long held goal in Asia Pacific. And also, obviously, on the retail side, lower costs will also allow for more expenditure on health, education and micro enterprise investment for migrant related families um, through the savings obtained on transaction costs. As we have all experienced ourselves, the pandemic has accelerated progress in this area. According to the World Bank in a recent report, globally in low and middle income economies, even excluding China, over 40% of adults who made payments um, using a card or phone or the internet did so for the first time ever. But this is only one building block of true integration or true digital connectivity. Importantly, last year, and I'm very glad to welcome uh, you know, our colleagues on the panel on this topic, the world saw the first of its kind ever globally cross-border payment system created through the linkage of Singapore's PayNow and Thailand's PromptPay real-time retail payment systems. Um, now, you may think that, you know, this is common. We have, you know, wire transfers, international transfers, etc. But this is the first system that allows you to transfer across borders without the need to populate information fields such as full name or bank account as one would do with normal solutions. And while the system now is only for funds for about a um, thousand Singapore dollars daily, it will be completed in a matter of minutes, uh, not days with a 2.1% cost, which is, of course, well under the 3% target of the SDGs. And I believe BOT and MAS, I believe plans are also underway to progressively scale this partnership to include more participants, but also to extend the transfer limits to facilitate business transactions. So such a system, which was a key collaboration under the ASEAN uh, payment connectivity, it also closely aligns with efforts by the G20, Financial Stability Board, and other international standard setting bodies to facilitate cheaper, more inclusive, and transparent cross-border payment arrangements. Of course, in today's era, 
challenges around security, privacy, transparency of key importance in addition to cost and time, um, and, and as is the prevention of illicit financial flows. And as we know, while Asia and the Pacific is a leader compared to the rest of the global economy on digital payment systems, many of these payment systems are standalone and, and fragmented. So interoperability, which is the key to unlocking um, true connectivity, remains the next step. Um, and that requires harmonization along regulatory standards, compliance, AML, CFD, KYC, and other key uh, anti-fraud concerns. In our region today, we have a huge heterogeneity in systems, currencies, frameworks. So these are the important questions to answer um, as we look forward to, to the future. So with that, I, I'll pass back to Alberto. I, I look forward to the insight and learnings of all of our panel members who represent different constituents in this debate and about where we are today and where we can go as a region. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Suva. I appreciate your remarks. I would now like to introduce the, the panelists. We have a diverse uh, panel, both uh, geographically and also in terms of uh, different areas of expertise. Uh, I would like to introduce first uh, Professor Douglas Arner from the University of Hong Kong. Douglas has been a frequent uh, collaborator of FESCAP and um, we are, I'm very happy that he's uh, available today for this event. Second, we have uh, Ms. Sassinan Pantuna, Assistant Director of the Payment Systems Policy Department of the Bank of Thailand. And she's going to tell us about the, really this great experiment between PromPay and PayNow linkage between Thailand and Singapore. Next, uh, we are going to move to Pakistan. We are moving from east to west, as you can see. Uh, we have Mr. Mohamed Arif Sargana, Director General for Commercial Affairs of Pakistan Telecommunications Authorities. Uh, Pakistan has done a remarkable, make a remarkable progress in, the, um, in, its, in its national e-payment systems, which is a prerequisite, you know, to, to have this type of connectivity across borders. So I think it will be very interesting to hear here about his ex this experience. And finally, we have the Secretary General of ASEAN Asian Clearing Union, Mr. Farhat Morsali Pavarsi. This is an entity that was actually created by, by ESCAP like almost 50 years ago and uh, it's, a, it's an entity that is a clearing house that um, its members are central banks from different uh, countries in Asia. He will explain more about it, but it is a, a very good uh, organization for for supporting countries in, you know, other more modern endeavors in the payments uh, area. So I feel I'm very, I'm very pleased that he also joined this event. So having introduced the panel, let me now, without further ado, uh, give the floor to Mr. Douglas Arner to start the to start the panel discussion. Douglas, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Albert, and uh, many thanks, Suba, for an excellent introduction. I'm actually going to pull up uh, some slides which will be available for you um, immediately after the event. Um, you know, what I want to talk about is uh, really highlighting some of, of these issues. And I think the starting point is that money, finance, payment, uh, and technology have a very long history together. But if we look over really the past 50 years, um, technologies have absolutely transformed payments. We can think about uh, the development of cross-border electronic payments with SWIFT, in the 1970s, the progressive expansion of real-time gross settlement systems on a domestic basis across first developed and then emerging and developing countries across uh, the 1980s, the 1990s. We can think about the advent uh, of mobile payments, of M-Pesa, of Alipay uh, in 2007, 2010. We can think about the advent uh, of blockchain and cryptocurrencies beginning from 2008, 2009. We can think about the advent of fast payment systems, uh, and we can think about the advent of central bank digital currencies. The short point here is that we have a long history, especially in the context of central banks, of thinking about how we can best use technology 
in the context of uh, the payments and the monetary system. I think there's a starting point, particularly when we think about some of the current uh, volatility that we're seeing in global currency markets, that if we think about the core functions of central banks, one of those is very much uh, monetary stability. Monetary stability, a trusted functional monetary instrument uh, is a public good for the wider functioning, not only of the financial system, but uh, of the economy. And we can think about this from the standpoint of uh, some of risks from the standpoint of financial stability, for instance, in the context of, of Herstat risk, which central banks focus on. But we can also think about it from the standpoint of really enabling uh, the positive externalities of finance. And I think prior to COVID, we were often very focused on payments, one from financial stability, two from the standpoint uh, of monetary policy, three from the standpoint of monetary stability as a public good. But we were also increasingly focused on the role of digital payments in the context of financial inclusion and the value that we would see from the standpoint uh, of giving individuals access to payments to enable their own planning, their own development, uh, but also from the standpoint of the wider economy. You know, I think what COVID very much highlighted is an expansion in that sort of core function that increasingly we're actually thinking of digital payments in particular as a function, as a core instrument for resilience in the face of crises. I think it's something that we all experience very directly in the context of COVID. The ability to make and receive electronic payments is really a, a core way of addressing not only COVID, but the increasing climate uh, famine and other sorts of crises that we're seeing with increasing frequency. And I think also in the context of our research, we've been looking increasingly at the role of digital finance from the standpoint of achieving the sustainable development goals. And what we're finding is that actually uh, the ability to make and receive payments is very powerful from the standpoint of supporting positive progress from the standpoint of actually improving performance in the context of many of the SDGs. And, you know, I think if we think about COVID, we can see it driving forward payments. Um, big focus on this idea of building better financial systems. I think we're seeing um, really discussions at the domestic level in the context of central bank digital currencies, uh, at the regional level, which we'll be discussing more of, and at the international level of how we can actually use new technologies to build better financial systems, better cross-border and regional payment systems. And in a recent paper, my team and I looked at this context in the context of some of these initiatives. And one thing that we are seeing is an increase in regional efforts to develop payment systems and in particular to reduce the costs uh, and increase stability for cross-border payments within individual regions. And certainly if we look at uh, the EU with uh, the development uh, of the target system, with the development of uh, the European single payments area. These have been some of the leading efforts. But we've also seen major progress, uh, particularly in the context of, uh, of West Africa, uh, systems basically where we are seeing the development similarly to the European context uh, of common wholesale systems, standards for retail payments, and in some cases, actually common currencies, common central bank systems. Likewise, as we'll see, a range of projects uh, across this region. And what we review are some of the different efforts. And what we're seeing are really a range, ranging from basically at the start, common standards, 
in order to basically enhance interoperability. And we can see this in the context of technical standards, which can be as simple as harmonizing QR codes, or as complex as the harmonization of uh, extensive payment communication standards, as well as individual systems. We also see that legal and regulatory factors, both on um, the market integrity AML side, but also on the payments licensing and operations side, are very important from the standpoint of making these projects work. The second level that we're seeing are actually efforts to build um, switches or interchanges or interconnect systems between individual uh, domestic systems. And this is something where, in particular, the, the Bank for International Settlements is very heavily engaged in a range of projects, not only in this region, but really across the world. We're also seeing, as I mentioned, a number of examples where you actually have regions, Europe and West Africa in particular, where they are seeking to build uh, a single system. This may be sort of first best in many ways, but from a sovereignty uh, or a political standpoint, it can often be very difficult to achieve. At the same time, those systems of building standards for interoperability, building a switch, or building an optional system. And we're seeing an increasing range of countries building SWIFT-like international payment systems, like SIPs in China, MIR in Russia, uh, and a range of others. And finally, we're seeing an increasing range of central bank digital currency projects, either from the standpoint of individual countries, like uh, the ECNY project in China, or from the standpoint of an increasing range of projects to actually build interoperability or switches between individual central bank digital currencies as they are developed across different countries. And I think this is a key view on CBDCs that, that because so few have actually been launched so far that there is a real opportunity as systems are developed to work to build up common approaches to support interoperability, which will have much wider benefits. And I think my last point is really from the standpoint of a second infrastructure where we are seeing very important impacts, and that is from the standpoint of identification systems. Individual digital identity systems in individual countries are really central to making systems work, and what we're seeing on the cross border basis is how can we interconnect the systems domestically, but importantly, how can we enable businesses through um, essentially common approaches? So with that, uh, back to you, Alberto. Thank you very much, Douglas, for a very, very good introduction uh, to the topic. I take an uh, important keyword, interoperability. You know, that's what we are looking at after, right? To be able to connect uh, different systems in a way that is seamless and, uh, and uh, effective. Uh, and I think that we are going to hear a very, very good explanation of how it works from, from Thailand in a, in a few minutes. But I would like to make one remark. You know, I, I, I found interesting the, what you mentioned about West Africa, that they are trying to build from scratch a unified system, right? Perhaps it is advantage that they they don't have legacy systems, so they can they can directly you know leapfrog to to the most advanced method. This is probably not available for most countries. I mean, most countries have some legacy systems, so it's probably the interconnection or the way to combine to to make these uh, different systems compatible. It probably will be uh, more effective, uh, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. Anyway, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Kunsa Sinan, please. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Alberto. Yeah, and um, hello to everyone. I'm Susan from a Bank of Thailand. And uh, first of all, I have to say that thank you so much for having me here to share the developments of the Prompt Pay and Pay Now. And I have prepared uh, some slides that I would like to share with you guys. Uh, okay, uh, just a minute, please. Okay. Um, do you see the slide? Oops. 
Not yet, um, but we have a backup if you need to. We can present I, I, it. I think I, I, OK, I try again one more time. Okay. Okay. Yeah, click on share yeah. and this. Yeah, I think it's coming. Yeah, yeah there it is. You, yeah, you, you, OK, let me see. Let see. me show. Let me show it first. OK, yeah, that's perfect. OK, yeah, that's yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, as uh, the prompt paper now linkage, and we say that um, it's it it is um, like uh, uh, the the first the world's first linkage of the two retail payment system or the fast payment in terms of uh, our payment system is mean uh, the fast payment and um, by yeah and, and and as by linking up the prompt pay which is the retail uh, funds transfer in Thailand with the pay now in Singapore, this will um, enable the uh, people of the two countries to make the funds transfer just easily, just a click on their mobile applications and, you know, just only uh, using the recipient's uh, mobile numbers and then the fund will be transferred to the uh, uh, recipients almost near real time, I would say that. So this means that the, the benefits of domestic uh, fast payments are now available for the cross-border service as well. Yeah, and um, so to let's go back one step and look at the pain points of the traditional current service. Yeah, of course, that um, just like introductions. First is the because of the high cost, because like in our case uh, in Thailand, sometimes, you know, like uh, for the tradi traditional bank transfer, it might came up to like almost 13 percent of the transaction cost, which is very high. And and that's the reason why the, the migrants prefer to use the informal channel instead. And and secondly, we, we all see that um, it's because of the low speed, the long transaction time, you know, because uh, the tra traditional cross-border transfer may take like from an hour to a couple of business days. And uh, during these days, uh, these hours, uh, the senders and the recipients, they, are, they tend to be worried because they don't know when money is going to come. And like uh, in many cases, there's no confirmation function as well. And uh, the third point is uh, the, the inconvenience. Um, because um, the senders are required to input names, address, account number, account name, which is, you know, very tedious, very inconvenient. Yeah, and uh, at the point of uh, transparency, uh, because um, uh, some providers, they do not fully disclose the fees or the exchange rate that used for transfer or payment, you know, so it's kind of like, it, it's not very transparent to the consumers. And next for the access, you know, uh, the, of course, the high cost, you know, we would like a barrier to uh, financial inclusions. And the last point is that we can see from the, the pandemics that the cash payments or um, the physical contact at the bank branch, it caused the concerns for the health breaks. Okay? So that's why with, with all these pain points, which are in line with the um, a G20 target to be addressed. So then um, we came up with the linkage of the prompt pay and pay now under set of principle. Okay. The, the 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 first principle, of course, we focus on the users because the user experience is you know the heart of the project. You need some kind of um interconnected system with the friendly app that user can easily use it and you know like seamless just like they use it domestically. That that's that that that's the first point, and the second is that the system itself have to be efficient and safe, and also the business model need to be sustainable. Okay, and and the last point or uh, the IT security and AML CFT screening, these all functions have to put in place in order to prevent all the illegal activities. Yeah. Okay, and okay, uh, let me give you some of the detail of this project. Um, as you see that um, uh, the customer in Thailand and Singapore will be able to transfer funds through their mobile just in a matter of minutes. Okay, and um, user experience will be seamless, just like they do domestic uh, prompt pay or pay now transfer. And uh, the, the, the system will be linked and then comply with the IT security standard, of course, the international international standard like uh, Douglas has mentioned. Also the AML CFT standard that, uh, data protections and EPIC regulation of each countries. And um, in short, the benefits, you know, seamless, speedy, uh, safe, 
with the uh, attractive fee. With this, this, this point is very important as well because once we run the project, we um, communicate with the industry that we need something that um, can, you know, like compete with the traditional cross border. So if you introduce with the high fee, a uh, high cost, then you know you cannot uh, attract the customer to use these service. So then uh, they come up with, you know, some type of like uh, rational pricing uh, to serve for the customer and also make the business um, uh, uh, viable. Yeah. Uh, and also um, at, at the beginning phase, there are a limited uh, number of pilot banks on each country, like five Thai banks join this project and three uh, Singaporean banks join this project with the transfer limits that up to uh, $1,000 or 25,000 baht per transaction uh, on daily basis. So this is the, uh, the like the in initial stage. So we just introduce, you just cap the transfer limits. Yeah. So in the future, uh, what's next? Our plan is we hope to expand the numbers of the bank you know, to join the projects and also raise the limits. So the business sectors, they can be able to make use of this service as well. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, just, you know, like show you just um, quick, you know, like how easy a transfer can be made through the from pay, pay now linkage. You you can see the, the screen, right? Um, first, uh, on the left hand side, uh, the first step is that Let's say that I would like to uh, transfer the fund to my friend in Singapore. So I just open my mobile app. OK, and then um, you see that I uh, the first line, I can enter my friend's uh, mobile number. This one is mobile number in Singapore. And then uh, the transfer amount that I would like to uh, remit to her. And uh, the app will, you know, like convert it into Sing dollars. So I check everything is okay. Then I go to the uh, second step. Second step uh, in the middle is called like confirmation stage. Is that um, uh, once I enter the mobile, my friend's mobile number in Singapore at the back end, actually the system will send this mobile number to the pay now system in order to get, you know, the name uh, associated with the pay now account, you know, get the name and return the name into the prompt pay, then you know uh, the the name of my friend will be displayed on the phone. This is just you know to make sure that um, I uh, send the money to the right person, so I can check the, the consumer can check you know like uh, the the correctness of the recipient here. Yeah, and you can see that uh, the recipient's name is masking. Yeah, so because this one we have to comply with the personal data protection laws and regulations. Yeah, and also in this stage, it's very important because in the prompt pay system, once uh, we got the, the name of the recipients, right, then the system will check, you know, do the sanctions screening against the sender's name and uh, information and also the recipient's name to check uh, that both, both of them are not in the backlist. OK, then if everything is OK, then, you know, I check all the uh, amount and um, you know, like all the fee chart, the fee chart um, and the exchange rate ha have to be displayed uh, to the customers in order to you know make it more uh, transparent. Yeah, and if every everything okay, then I just press confirm and then get to the third the third step. Sorry, the third step is that um, this is like uh, the notification stage. It mean that um, it will uh, inform me that the funds have been uh, deducted from my account and transferred to my friend's account in Singapore in real time. Yeah, so that that you know like uh, that that it is quick and easy. I would say that. Yeah, and um, from from you know like this uh, from pay pay now link is seen uh, that it's live since last April. So up until now, you know, it has gained popularities. I would say that, and um, it's uh, the transactions is over 22,000 transactions or more than 6 million uh, Singapore dollars that have been made through this linkage. And in the future, we we uh, try to onboard more banks on both sides, you know, so in order to uh, expand the coverage to the users and also expand the limit for, for the business. Yeah. And um, also the plan, yeah, we have also, you know, have a plan to have uh, interconnected the uh, real-time payment system with other countries in the futures as well. Yeah, 
So I think maybe I can end my presentation and back to you, Alberto. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kunsasinan. I see some questions, but let's please postpone the questions until all the speakers have a chance to provide their introductory remarks. I just like to comment on two things. You know, both Thailand and Singapore have fast payment systems, which yeah. allow this type of very quick transactions within the countries, right? Across uh, pretty much everybody. And uh, so this is, a, I would say, this is a prerequisite for this type of connectivity across countries. It makes things a lot easier. Also, the you know the customers in each country are already used to the, the experience of using their mobile phones for transactions. So it just kind of you know can move very seamlessly towards uh, international transactions. That's number one. Number two, you mentioned a, a blacklist. Uh, I, I presume this is for AML, um, you know, for anti-money laundering, uh, laundering compliance. Yeah. Uh, and this is also, I think, it's very important because um, I understand that the compliance is done. In, in each country before the transaction is approved, right? And if there are some suspicion, uh, the transaction will not go through, because that seems to be one of the most complicated issues. You know, how do you how do you do this compliance? You know, when you do this only multiple transactions, you know, internationally. So anyway, this is an important topic. I propose we we continue the discussion after all the panelists have spoken. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again, uh, Kunsasina. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Sargana. From uh, from Pakistan, please. Sorry, you're you're on mute. Uh. Can you listen to me now? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Alberto, and uh, uh, the thank you UNSCAP for providing this opportunity to present the case of Pakistan on digital financial services in this esteemed forum. And in a very br uh, brief, briefly, I would like to share some of the measures we have taken in Pakistan for uh, for for the digital financial services and what are the challenges for the cross-border uh, e-payments. Uh, I think I should. Uh, I will share my 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 few slides so that everybody can see the things. Uh, so, Alberto, you have my presentation. If you can share, yes. Yeah, yeah. please, uh, Ken. Can you please uh, share the presentation? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Here it goes. OK, you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would just like, like to highlight that that financial inclusion is the type of top priority for by the government of Pakistan. And uh, in 2015, it has started some of uh, the final prop formal uh, financial in inclusion strategy. I am part of that strategy and uh, under this strategy, some of the measures have been taken by the central bank and the the, the, uh, the which is the regulator for the banks. And in some measures, we are working jointly with the state bank of Pakistan, which is the central bank uh, and the telecom regulator, so that the interoperability among the banks and the telcos be ensured, so <clears throat> that the easy and prompt payments can be made uh, by by in the domestic market uh, just for for uh, for the information of the the audience uh, and presenter over here with with my experience what i have seen is that uh, the regulators for all, all kind of the regulators and the governments are trying their level best for to making this digital financial inclusion services uh, much more uh, uh, very less expensive and cheaper for the people of Pakistan to to you know uh, to reach the banking services to the far flung areas. Yeah. However, what in my experience, what is required that uh, or what is the deficiency or where we need to you know more to put the more impression is that uh, that digital companies or the telcos and the banks they need much more you know uh, cooperation with each other and share some of their revenues or profits 
so that this service can be provided to the you know general people in uh, easy easily and in uh, in expensive manner and still as a as a as a regulator we are working on it and these uh, uh, companies are hesitant always hesitant to share their platform with each other without sharing their revenues so there is a requirement that we we close to together these uh, digital companies and the banks so that this can be made easily after the financial inclusion i would like to say that some of the measures which have been taken by the central bank for example first of all they have issued they have introduced the rast account in this rast uh, mm -hmm. program this is basically a payment system in which the uh, the existing accounts can be made uh, you know linked with the mobile number and the people for the, in the domestic market they can transfer the money from one account to another account very easily in a cheap manner this is a uh, cheaper way for transferring of the money in the in the the uh, domestic market similarly there is there was a need for uh, the payment local payment gateway system which which require a huge investment and uh, the central bank of pakistan uh, in in collaboration with the bill gate melinda foundation and the local organization they have already established the micro gate my micro payment gateway in pakistan which is you know now you don't have to for the domestic uh, transactions you don't have to go for these transactions on the international platforms uh, this is uh, a state of the art interoperable and secure payment platform that enables the consumers merchants and the government entities to exchange the funds in seamless instant and cost effect effective manner so uh, this uh, this was a big uh, project which has been taken by the central bank and then uh, an other step which has been taken is the you know pay park to promote the domestic e payment in a cost effective manner a domestic payment system card it's a, it's a plastic card like like the visa or the master cards which has been introduced in 2020 which is more than 10, 10 times less costly than the international visa and master cards so uh, the state bank of pakistan has directed the banks to make the pay park as a default card to make the bank banking accounts less costly uh, <clears throat> i'm I'm briefing these measures by the central bank very briefly, but more I would like to you know chat about the uh, easy mobile account which has been uh, which has been lately in the in the, the in this session which has been issued uh, by by jointly by the state central bank and the regulator. So I will brief on on that. I'm coming on that. Before that, I would like to say that the cross border e-payment is still a challenge for for the pakistan for, for pakistan central bank and of course the digital companies uh, the one uh, other effort which has been made that uh, that is the roshan digital account which has which has been introduced by the state bank of pakistan it provides all the banking for facilities for millions of the non-resident pakistanis or expats who are living in for uh, other countries to seeking to undertake the banking, payment and investment activities in Pakistan. Under this account, the expats, they can open the account in the local banks uh, remotely and put the money in that account. And even that, that uh, money can be transferred in Pakistan for the investment and other purposes. However, it's not vice versa. From Pakistan, we cannot put the money in this account only the expatriates who are living in the foreign uh, countries they can open this account in the local banks remotely and then they can put the money in it and they can make the investment in pakistan transfer the money in pakistan but the real challenge is full-fledged easy prompt and you know in expensive or cheaper payment across the uh, across the borders next slide please yeah, this is what I would like to you know uh, highlight 
a little bit more of it under the financial inclusion strategy. I'm also part of it and the central bank is the focal point for this financial inclusion strategy in Pakistan. The real challenge was that, you know, that we have a banking system which is catering only the few of the population in Pakistan. Uh, the real challenge is to bring into the huge unbanked population in far flung areas. And for those who do not have even the access for the Internet, because the Internet penetration is growing, Internet is growing very fast in Pakistan, but still, you know, it's uh, not more than 50 or 55 percent in, in Pakistan. So the, the real challenge was and still is to serve this huge unbanked population for to provide the banking services for the transfer of the money and for this one where Central Bank and the telecom regulator, we have worked jointly for the last uh, many years where we have issued the regulation, joint regulations named the TPSP, third party service providers uh, regulations. Under these regulations, we have you know, uh, established a switch among the all mobile operators and among the 13 commercial banks. So, for the domestic payments, now the, this switch, uh, which is a TPSPV, uh, you can make the payments from any of uh, the, the telcos to any bank. So this is an any to any model and then interoperability among uh, banks and interoperability among the telcos. So this is, you know, unique model. This is basically a USSD solution <clears throat> where the operators, telcos are providing this service to the banks. And uh, as the regulator, we have a number of the meetings where we have, you know, come up with the solution for uh, revenue sharing and then, you know, uh, that uh, authentication of the accounts by the Nadra. <laughs> Uh, by the, through biometric systems under this scheme, which is AMA as Asan mobile account, or you can say it easy mobile account, the people in far flung areas living in rural areas who don't have the access to internet and you who even don't have the smartphones, they can open the account by dialing double two six two star double two six two hash in 13 banks in in just three to five minutes and after opening the accounts they can put the money in the uh, in the, in this account and then they can transfer the money from uh, other accounts and for the business for the payments and uh, you know for for uh, utility bill payments etc so this is a very unique and we expect that it would it would revolutionize the digital financial services in Pakistan because you don't need internet you don't need smartphone for opening the account and managing your accounts so this is uh, basically a unique uh, we and very uh, i think uh, local solution for the digital financial services and i hope it will work very uh, very well can you please next slide please yeah so uh, as i have already mentioned that pta made the concerted efforts to complete the integration and the agreements between the banks and the third party service providers and the mobile operators for ama scheme this scheme has been launched commercially on 11th of August 2020 and, and which enabling customers of all the four mobile operators to open the bank accounts as I have already highlighted in this uh, meeting. Uh, already the, the, the mass media campaign has been launched by, and by the PTA, Pakistan Telecom Authority and the State Bank of Pakistan with the help of the UK aid and uh, it's a uh, already working and so uh, most of the banks commercial banks they have already you know uh, even the existing accounts can be shifted on this account so far the the 
uh, 13 uh, commercial banks are already on board and we expect that other three or four banks which are remaining will also be on board in shortly and success is that you you will see that for uh, it is commercially launched in on 11th august but it was soft launch was few months back and so far the ama accounts have already crossed the mark of 5 million and we have expect that we will reach the the accounts of the 10 million uh, by by 2023 so, and the this ama scheme has great potential of contributing towards digital financial inclusion of the common citizens and reduce the gender gap as well because you know that <coughs> particularly uh, this account will be helpful for for the women who are working in far flung areas and cannot sell their products in the main market and collect the money directly from the you know buyers. There is a middleman so uh, who, who buys the things from these women and then he 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 is getting the main share of the product. So I think it, this will be a great my year for uh, for the for, for 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 women to do the business in the far flung areas. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, so, so this is uh, sorry, Mr. Sagana. We are running out of time. We have still one okay. more speaker. If would you uh, mind to wrap up? Well, sorry yeah, to interrupt in, you. In two minutes. Two okay. more minutes. Uh, okay. Just uh, in this slide, you can see that uh, how much. Just uh, I have put some uh, some of the stats that how many transactions are being done by these uh, digital financial services. You can see that agents are, are five. Five uh, thirty-four thousand are agents, uh, agents right now in all over Pakistan, and value of the transaction in 2021 was about the eight billion rupees uh, by by these digital financial platforms. Next slide, please. This is my uh, final and uh, final slide. So the uh, which are the challenges? This what I have already explained is for the domestic market. For international market or the cross border, we have still we have a challenges for these e-payments. Uh, for cross border, commercially usually have restrictions on the type of the payments. Except for instance, international online shops do not generally accept national debit card and domestic e-wallet schemes. Recently, the government of Pakistan has worked with the Amazon. Uh, to enable the payments for merchants from the Pakistan, but still hurdles are there for opening the international e-payment services. Cross-border regulatory friction restrict across the border e-payments as already highlighted by the Alberto and the uh, other speakers. So same is uh, like all other developing countries. We are, for example, the anti-money laundering process, regional initiatives, for this, I think uh, the, the the point comes like the UN that the, there should be a regional initiative required to coordinate the e-payments and regulatory approaches so that the prompt payments can be made easily. There is a need to enhance the payment safely and reliably and foreign exchange control restrictions, international payments, high exchange rate cost due to the volatility. And the country specific data flow barriers and data localization rules also need to be you know, integrated with each other so that these payments can be made easily and promptly to cross border uh, people. So uh, I think I got uh, more time, time more than <laughs> allocated to me and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Sargana. Very interesting. I think that the AMA accounts is a great, uh, great initiative. I think that if you want to take advantage of this uh, interconnectivity at, at, across country, first you need to connect uh, people within the country, right? Uh, one question I have, but uh, I mean, just a reflection on this. We don't have time, uh, but hopefully in the, in the q and is how uh, how the RAS system can actually bring on board all these new AMA. Uh, accounts, you know, because that uh, will be the next step, probably, right? Anyway, uh, I think it's quite interesting, and um, this is this is a very, very uh, Pakistan is really doing a lot of good progress, you know. Especially, uh, I like this uh, RAS system, you know, in place uh, because this is similar to PromPay or PayNow, and that uh, will facilitate the interconnection with other uh, fast payment systems in other countries. Uh, without further ado, I want to give the floor to Mr. Farhat uh, Morsali the Secretary General of the Asian Clearing Union. The floor is yours, sir. 
Yeah. Good morning to everyone and good afternoon to other colleagues from some parts of the you know the world because it's eight o'clock in Iran and it's the weekend to be honest. And uh, I'm very happy to be with you and uh, it's my great pleasure to be presenting as the Secretary General of the Asian Clearing Union. So uh, I know we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to uh, very shortly, you know, run into the presentation part. Uh, Alberto, is it is it visible? I just uploaded my presentation part. Yeah, okay. it is fine. I see. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, today I want to talk about the you know Asia Clearing Union experiences and innovation on cross border e payments. And uh, as I told you, uh, because we have you know shortage of time, so I will be very briefly talk about the main function and the measures that the members countries have taken in this regard. So as everybody knows, uh, Asian Clean Union was established, as Alberto mentioned at the beginning of the session, uh, was established by, you know, UNSCOP in 1974 and, uh, you know, uh, more than 50 years. And the member countries include, you know, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Iran, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. And basically the central banks and monetary authorities are members of, you know, this you know, union and the main function actually of you know this union is to facilitate you know clearing and not settlement but clearing. But we take care of settlement when it comes to the settlement period uh, on, on a multilateral basis. So it is actually uh, a, a union to offset debits and credits of uh, the member countries within the settlement period, which is every two months. And uh, the, the the you know. Um, the time for the settlement is two plus four, so the member countries have four days to do the settlement. And of course, we have more you know, other issues, but because of the you know, time, I, I will be talking about the main issues. And you know, uh, if I want to talk about the you know uh, some facts and figures, I should say that in 2021, the transaction channel through the Asian Union mechanism was almost you know 29 billion dollars. So we did you know this you know clearing you know uh, in the Asian Clearing Union, and. Uh, uh, the main, you know, benefits of the membership in this union are uh, uh, to, to, to just, you know, give you the short list. Economizing, you know, affects, you know, reserves. So uh, when members actually uh, work within the Asian Clean Union, because we, we work on the multilateral basis, uh, so uh, actually uh, the members can save their, you know, foreign reserve, you know, uh, exchanges. And also, uh, uh, we are here to address trade, you know, imbalance between the member countries. And we, are, you know, when countries become a member, they are interested and eager to facilitate trade and monetary cooperation between each other. And uh, you know, uh, as I told you, the main function of Asian Credit Union is clearing. So uh, uh, we do our best to have really high clearing efficiency. It is around you know, 80 percent clearing efficiency. So 20 percent goes to the settlement. Uh, the amount which has not been you know, cleared through our mechanism will be settled in the you know a settlement period. And the final you know uh, objective, if I want to tell you, is to reduce transfer costs, which is really important in these days. So uh, uh, I have included the measures that the members' countries actually have taken in terms of cross-border e-payments, but mostly uh, they are uh, about you know wholesale you know payment systems. Of course, I have included some retail payment systems and domestic and local you know, payment systems as well. And as we had one you know, uh, presenter from Pakistan, I did include you know, Pakistan here. So uh, if I want to talk about you know, the members, I should, I should start from you know, Bangladesh you know, Central Bank. You know, Bangladesh Central Bank, uh, Central Bank is using you know, national payment switch Bangladesh NPSP and real-time in you know, across uh, uh, settlement RTGS mechanism within Bangladesh while contemplating to use in you know, RTGS system case across border payment. So they are right now focusing on more domestic you know, issues, but they are you know, on the verge of you know, coming and connecting to other countries as well. And uh, uh, the second member actually, uh, India, which actually has done really great you know, issues in this term, uh, and they have one system unified payment interface, UPI, which was launched in 2016, and it contributes over 70% of total retail digital payments in India. And also, you know, uh, as today we are talking about pay now, pay from, also they are talking with monetary authority of Singapore to build their fast payment system, UPI and pay now. So they are actually connecting to this, you know, system. And also they have another, you know, uh, measure, which is an international, you know, card rupee. And uh, it is accepted by one uh, over, you know, 195, uh, you know, countries. And they have one domestic 
financial messaging system, which is actually a structured financial messaging system or SFMS, and uh, and they are actually expanding SFMS and infinite frameworks across jurisdictions. So they want to actually uh, export it to other countries as well. And the next, you know, country is you know Central Bank of Iran. I have included just two measures. They have done, you know, um, I didn't know that uh, they uh, that the talk will be about, you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, retail, you know, internal payments, you know, mobile application and the other one, because Iran has done lots of things as well. But I have included just two, you know, issues. We have SEPOM, which is a financial messaging system, both, you know, nationwide and worldwide. To be honest, uh, since Iran is under the sanctions, so they, they do not have access to, uh, you know, SWIFT. And uh, so they have developed one messaging system, uh, SEPOM which is used both uh, for local you know, central banks and also in international central banks, the, the banks which are you know, willing to work with Iran. And also uh, there's one private you know, sector you know, system, which is SIMS, uh, and then, then uh, it is also a financial missing system exactly like SEPOM, but it, it has been developed by private sector. And uh, the next you know, uh, country is the Maldives you know, Monetary Authority. You know, uh, uh, the Maldives Monetary Authority is right now in, in talks with UN ESCOP and also uh, UN you know, uh, DESA to develop central bank digital currency. They are on the verge of a you know, case study and they are doing you know the level best to you know launch it very soon. And also they are in discussion with Reserve Bank of India. I mean the central bank of you know India to use you know, dom domestic currencies in cross border you know settlement and uh, hopefully they will you know launch it very, very soon. And the next you know, central bank, I mean, uh, the Nepal Russia uh, Bank, uh, they are actually talking to some fintech companies uh, in their uh, country and also other, you know, fintech companies in other, you know, jurisdictions and countries to uh, have, you know, remittance, you know, payment system and the other products. So, yeah, yeah, they are open to, you know, suggestion from fintech, you know, companies across the world to come to their country and launch, you know, these, you know, systems for them. And, uh, you know, uh, Central Bank of you know, Sri Lanka, as you know, Sri Lanka is, uh, as far as I know, is, is host to some fintech companies such as Millennia, and uh, they are uh, actually one of the you know, uh, pioneers of you know, uh, digitalization. So they, they are using mobile phone based you know, money and financial services and communication companies such as Western Union and MoneyGram. And also they have, you know, uh, uh, they, are, they are on the verge of you know, launching one system, Lanka Remit in 2022 at the National Remittance Mobile Application. And also they are uh, actually trying uh, their best to join you know, Asian Payment uh, Network APN uh, for both local and international you know, uh, payments. So as I told you, including you know, Pakistan, because we had you know, one speaker from Pakistan, so I thought that yeah, it, it is better for me to talk about it. So uh, uh, about you know Asian clearing you know uh, uh, future plans in terms of you know cross border e payments and also financial messaging system, right now in the Secretariat we are uh, working on one uh, you know internal unified I should say financial messaging system, which is named ACMR. Uh, this uh, financial messaging system will be like you know Swift. Of course, we right now we have one, but we are going to expand it. Uh, it's like you know Swift, but just for the member countries, and hopefully with the help of you know Scope and the other you know uh, associations in the world and other countries that we are on the verge to invite to become a member of you know Asian Clearing Union. Hopefully we will use it, and uh, I think uh, at the end of this year it will be launched, and the member countries uh, will be able to use you know this uh, system. And uh, I have included one actually uh, slide uh, Alberta as well. What actually we ex uh, expect, you know, SCOP to do for us and help us and assist us in terms of, you know, uh, expanding our activities. You know, uh, I, I took over the Secretary General in a position, uh, I think, four months ago. So before me, it wasn't a policy to invite more countries to become of Asia, a, a member of Asian Clearing Union. But it is on the top of the agenda of Asian Clearing Union to invite more countries, central banks of more countries to become a member of Asian Clearing Union. So. We actually uh, we uh, want to uh, ask you know SCOP to help us to invite more countries to become a member of Asian Clearing Union. You know the name I should say that the name is Asian Clearing Union, but it's not limited to Asia. To be honest, uh, based on the article of our association, uh, any country which is a member of SCOP can become a member of you know uh, Asian Clearing 
Union uh, with two third boards of the you know, board of the Asia Korean Union. And if a country is not a member of UNESCO, can also apply for the membership, but uh, they should actually get the unanimous you know, vote of the board of the Asia Korean Union. So we would like to invite you know any country who is willing to become a member of you know this you know union to to, to send us the you know the request and we will you know consider the you know membership request very soon. And also uh, we would like to ask you know a stop to invite us to capacity building programs such as this one that today we have. And also I think this can also I don't know I'm not familiar with the scope very much to be honest. Uh, I don't know if SCOP is working on uh, diffusing a standard such as you know standards for payments or financial messaging you know, system. It's, it, it's a very good you know, platform to uh, diffuse the standards for the member countries. As I know, it's, it's the biggest, you know, uh, you know, commission of the UN. So it is a very, you know, useful, you know, platform for diffusing standards. And also, um, SCOP can, I believe that, can have, you know, one internal payment system for the member countries, you know, right? It can be very useful and attractive for the member countries. And um, and ACU can become a, the clearing house for the member countries of the SCOP too. Good. Uh, Alberto, I know uh, I talked very briefly, and uh, it's a, that I, uh, we had seven or eight minutes, so I just, you know, uh, ran into the main points of, you know, the measures that we have taken in uh, ACU. If there's any question, I would be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Morsalin. I uh, really appreciate your, your comments. Very interesting to know about the status of your members in the area of payments. And uh, also, thank you for uh, anticipating what I was going to ask at the, at the end, what a, a SCAP can do. <clears throat> and I take your points, you know, technical assistance and interoperability and capacity building, the dissemination of standards and uh, the development of international internal payment systems. And these are all great, uh, you know, suggestions. Uh, of course, uh, SCAP is not a technical body. Uh, we can do this in collaboration with partners like ITU and and UNCDF perhaps, but definitely as the regional uh, intergovernmental partner uh, platform, we definitely can can bring you know countries together and provide that type of support. You know that's basically what ESCAP is all about. I think that we are past the time, so I would like to make a suggestion. I I saw. Thank you so much, uh, Kunsa Sinani. I, I see that you answer many questions. I hope this is okay for the people who will, uh, ask these questions uh, in the chat box. But some of you may have more questions, and unfortunately, we don't have time. So what I would like to propose <clears throat> is you receive our uh, message, our email message for, uh, after your registration from SCAP slash MPDD. Uh, all of you got this email, so please uh, go to that email. If you have any remaining question, please uh, feel free to send them and we will channel the question to the appropriate uh, participant. Also goes for the panelists. I, I, I think that probably some of the panel might have questions to each other uh, and it's a shame that uh, we run out of time. But please use this email uh, communication. We definitely will share them with the appropriate person. So it's no problem. You know, we can do that and communicate later with you. Okay, uh, we are getting to the end of it, and uh, I think it was a great discussion. I I learned new things certainly. I hope that the the audience also found it uh, useful, and at least uh, they probably it's an introductory talk. You know, there's a lot more to go in this area. It's a very you know very complex uh, area, and we haven't really touched upon the you know the compl complexities in the back end of these systems. You know, all the nitty gritties and how they work. Uh, hopefully in the future we'll have opportunities to have a more detailed or more technical uh, work, uh, workshop on this area. Maybe next year we'll see if we progress you know, in this particular area of work. But um, I think that this is very, very important, uh, these uh, this new developments, and particularly for, for migrants. <clears throat> as, you, as it was mentioned in the case of uh, Thailand and also Pakistan, that many migrants uh, go to informal channels because they find it so expensive and complicated, you know, to transfer money through through banks, right? And that is uh, is not much cheaper, I would say, and also you know creates risks also for the for the migrants sending these remittances. And also, I think there is a systemic issue that you know you need to take into account because remittances globally now is uh, you know the, the year of the pandemic in 2020 they were even more important than FDI in in the total volume of transactions. 
And initially, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a, a, a fear that the remittances will, will fall. And actually, they didn't. You know, they fall very little. And in many countries, the remittances actually increase. And the reason is that, of course, there was more need at home, so migrants, you know, send more money, right? So remittances are very important, you know, both for uh, at the micro level for individual families, you know, receiving these remittances, but also at the macro level, right? And from the macro point of view, I mean, when you have this money that is channeled through informal channels, they don't, it doesn't go to the central bank. So it creates also, uh, it has an impact on the volume of reserves that central bank holds. So I think that uh, expanding these uh, digital payment systems could be also very useful to, you know, to kind of channel these remittances through the proper, you know, formal channels. And that would be also good for central banks, you know, to have more, more reserves. And also, you know, perhaps it can improve the country's credit ratings because credit rating agencies look at, uh, at central banks' uh, reserves as one of the indicators that they, they consider. Anyway, uh, just, a, just a thought, you know, that uh, about, you know, potential areas, you know, to explore uh, down the road. So I want to uh, close by thanking, you know, deeply to the four panelists. Uh, it's been great presentation, very interesting. I really appreciate your contribution today. I also want to express my gratitude to Suva for coming and providing a very good initial remarks, you know, to, to guide us, uh, our discussions. And uh, I hope to see you all again in a future event. Thank you so much and have a great uh, rest of the day. Whatever you are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you for providing the opportunity.